This morning we are, we are looking at the, the parable of the great dinner, the parable of the great dinner, which is uh, uh, in Luke, the gospel of Luke, chapter 14, verses 15 through 24. Will you hear the word of the Lord as given to us uh, from the gospel of Luke? One of the dinner guests on hearing this said to him, Blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then Jesus said to him, Someone gave a great dinner and invited many. At the time of the dinner, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of land and I must go see it. Please accept my regrets. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to try them out. Please accept my regrets. Another said, I have just been married, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant returned and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and said to his servant, Well, then go out at once into the streets and to the lanes, of the town and bring in the poor and the crippled, the blind and the lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you ordered has been done, and there is still room in the house. Then the master said to the servant, Well, then go out into the roads and the lanes and compel people to come in so that my house may be filled, for I tell you, none of those who were invited will taste my dinner. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, we've kind of joined the program in the middle of, uh, of, the, uh, of the story. So let me give uh, the setting and the context of this parable. Um, uh, when uh, Jesus gave this parable, when he was, uh, went to dinner at the house of a leader of the Pharisees. Now, it appears that... Uh, Jesus' discussion uh, uh, was about dinner etiquette prior to this. Uh, prior to this, um, dinner etiquette and and charity uh, prompted the telling of this story. Um, at this particular dinner, at the house of the leader of the Pharisees, Jesus noted that the guests were jockeying for uh, for uh, places of honor. Uh, which is uh, to be seated at places of honor, which is nearest the host. And Jesus said, fellas, fellas, listen, uh, uh, when you're invited by someone to a wedding banquet, um, don't just waltz in and sit at the table closest to the bride's groom table, bride and groom's table, the place of honor, uh, unless you know for sure what the seating arrangement is, unless the wedding coordinator tells you which table you're sitting at. Because someone more distinguished, a family member, uh, may come in after you, and the bride's mother or father will have to come and ask you to move to a different table, and you will be embarrassed in front of all of the other guests. Uh, if you don't know where the host wants you to be seated, sit at the table furthest away from the dance table, from the dance floor, rather, uh, the, the furthest from the family table, the furthest away from the bride and groom. So then if the host wants you to sit at a better table, the bride's mother will see that you're at the wrong table and will move you to a table close to where the family is sitting. Then you'll be honored uh, in the presence of everyone who sits at the table with you instead of humiliated. Now, this is just party etiquette. Uh, nothing life or death, nothing eternal here. Seems peculiar that Jesus would be offering these lighter life lessons. But then Jesus said, he used this uh, li a light life lesson to say, for all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And we see that the party etiquette discussion is an on-ramp to another discussion. And Jesus, uh, uh, because Jesus uh, offers more advice to the host of the party, this leader of the Pharisees, um, a subject that we would expect Jesus uh, to, uh, to bring up. And he says to, the, uh, to, his, to his host, 
uh, to the leader of the Pharisees, listen, the next time you have a dinner party in your home, something that would make it much better is instead of inviting your peers and your colleagues and neighbors in your socioeconomic circle of influence, um, who will reciprocate and invite you to their party, dinner parties, if you want to throw a successful dinner party that will have all of the city talking, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. I'm telling you, friend, Jesus said, you will be so blessed because they cannot repay. They can't repay you with a dinner party of their own. But if you'll do this, Change your guest list from this group of friends to those who can't improve their condition. My friend, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Now, I'm sure the other guests were saying, who invited this guy anyway? Talk about throwing a wet blanket on the mood of the party. And I'm sure the host was looking for ways to change the conversation, uh, to lighten the mood. Uh, uh, And then when uh, one guest keyed in on the topic of the resurrection of the righteous, when he heard Jesus say the resurrection of the righteous, uh, he offered a a, a toast of mutual admiration, as, as if to say, see how blessed we are. And he said, he blurted out, blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. What he was really saying is, won't it be great when we, when we have a dinner together in the kingdom of God? Because we have the assurance uh, we're talking uh, uh, that, that, uh, that we're on the king's guest list, and by virtue of our birthright, the king will seat us at the family table. Everyone raise your glass uh, to us who will celebrate on that great and glorious day. Yay, us. Peter, John, and James probably said, oh boy, I wish he hadn't have said that um, because Jesus is going to launch into a parable and we'll never get to eat dinner. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus said to this man and to everyone there and to the leader of the Pharisees, someone gave a, ba- a great banquet uh, dinner party, a banquet or dinner party and invited many an invitation, uh, the tra- tradition then was an invitation was sent out uh, way ahead of time, uh, and they all returned RSVPs. And then another invitation when, on the day of the dinner party, a personal invitation, a knock at the door. So just before the hors d'oeuvres were served, he sent out his servant to say to those who had been invited and had RSVP'd that they were coming Come on to the party. Come to the party. Everything's ready. The preparations are finished uh, for, my, for, my, uh, for my dinner party. Come to the party. We're all ready. But the Scripture says they all alike, every one of them, began to make excuses. Uh, and the first one said to him, well, I bought a piece of property. I need to go check it out. Uh, as if you don't check out the property before you buy it. But I need to go check out this piece of property. Please accept my regrets. Another one said, I've bought five, oaks and a, uh, five yoke of oxen, and I need to go test drive them. Uh, an- another one said, I've just been married. Now, now that one is a good excuse. Uh, um, who among us would say, uh, honey, I'm sorry, I forgot we were getting married on this date, and I RSVP'd, and I have to go, so we're going to have to delay the, the honeymoon. Uh, that, it would be a short-lived, a short-lived marriage, especially if I had tried that. But that was a good excuse. I've been married, therefore I cannot come. So the servant returned and reported to his master, they're not coming. Nobody's came. Uh, nobody's coming to the party after they said they would. And the owner of the house became angry and he said, go out into the streets and get everyone you can. Uh, bring in the poor and the crippled, the blind, the lame, uh, 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 the people of the town who, couldn't, who, uh, who, who, who didn't make the cut for the first uh, uh, guest list. And in ancient Palestine, these were folks, uh, these folks would be begging on the side of the road for alms uh, because of their physical disability and that, that prevented them from working. And the servant said, okay, I've gathered all, everybody I can find and still there's room in the house. So he said, go out into the roads and the lanes and compel travelers, passerbys who don't even live here, who are just traveling through the, the city, bring them in so that my house may be filled. Now, through this parable, Jesus made it clear that the ones who had been in covenant with God, the invited, 
the ones who were on the guest list, the invited, uh, by uninviting those they felt very unworthy of the kingdom are the ones who are now uninvited. Insiders suddenly became outsiders, and outsiders suddenly became insiders. Yet again, we don't see whether the guest who blurted out, blessed are those who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. I raise my glass to us. Isn't it good to be us and not them? We don't get to see if his heart was changed or not. Jesus ended the parable like he does many of his parables without giving us a resolution because again, again, we're invited to make this story our story. A decision to accept the invitation to the party becomes our decision. And party here uh, um, uh, is equal to participation in the kingdom, participation uh, in the work of the kingdom. Uh, The resolve to commit our hearts and lives to participate in the kingdom of God, uh, uh, that resolve becomes our resolve. We have an invitation to make that our resolve. The story becomes our story when we understand that the invitation is our invitation. We are invited into the presence of God. Uh, We're invited to live our lives in committed relationship with God. The invitation to the party is an invitation to, to, to transform from being perpetual invited guests to a host who throws party and parties and invites others, invites the outsiders. Now, I'm almost positive that Jesus didn't have this in mind when he gave this parable, but this is what I think about when I read this parable. We're going to show a slide here. Uh, This is uh, Chestnut Street Methodist Church in Portland, Maine. This church was built in 1856, and according to the the Maine Historical Society, Chestnut Street Methodist Church was known as the mother of Maine Methodism, and a number of other churches, uh, some who were still in existence, uh, uh, a number of other churches were launched and grew from this parent church, a powerful, vibrant church, but closed its doors in 2006. And in 2009, the former church became Grace Restaurant, a high-end restaurant and bar. Beautiful restaurant. Here's another one closer to home. The first congregational church in Tampa Heights, built in 1906, abandoned, just, just abandoned in 1980. And 2021 began, became Grand Cathedral Cigars, a bar and cigar lounge. Now, again, I don't think this is specifically what Jesus had in mind uh, in this parable. Uh, but when I read about a church that closed it, I want to say thank you to Miranda Morrisow who did the research on on this, and she found more. There were more that I could have shown, and every now and then you'll see something in an uh, entertainment or a food magazine about this uh, historical church that's been turned into, uh, turned into a restaurant. Um, but this is what I think about. Uh, th- this is the parable I think about when I, when I read about churches that have been turned into, uh, turned into restaurants or bars or cigar lounges. Now, on a different note, um, I know that I know that many of you don't follow sports at all, uh, but many of you do know about, uh, uh, and some of you follow the Tampa Bay Rays Major League Baseball team. And just as an analogy, uh, the Rays just finished their 25th season uh, in Tampa Bay, uh, playing all of their home games in Tropicana Field over in St. Petersburg. And by all measures, by all measures, the Rays had a very successful season. They, They won 99 out of their 162 games, one of the best records in Major League Baseball. Um, But the Tampa Bay Rays were eliminated in their first two playoff games um, last week. Um, But what was more disappointing and quite embarrassing for the whole Tampa Bay area when it comes in the context of being faithful to baseball was that both of those playoff games were played here in Tampa Bay and the attendance to those two playoff games was abysmal. They even made it, it was a, they were nationally televised, uh, these playoff games. Uh, and the, the announcers were even making fun 
of uh, how low the attendance was at these two playoff games. And many have surmised that the low attendance and low energy in the stadium contributed to the bad play of those two losses. The bad play and those two losses. Now, <clears throat> there were three other, other uh, playoffs, uh, playoff games ha- happening on that same day. Now, they were later in the day. Some have also attributed the low attendance to the fact that it was 3 o'clock in the afternoon on a Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, but I think somebody knew what was going to happen and predicted what was going to happen and put, and, and made them put them in that slot. But the other three playoff games, the stadiums were full and the, and the energy was off the charts. The noise was, was just off the charts. But the attendance to the Rays games typically are typically low throughout the season compared to other major league teams unless the Rays stadium is half filled with the opposing team's fans, which often happens, especially when the Yankees and the Red Sox come to town. Now, I am not a a committed Rays fan. Lynn and I went to a couple of games. Uh, games. I took one of, our, uh, one of our grandsons to one of the games this season. Uh, so I have no right to even weigh in on this matter. I haven't been faithful to, to the Rays as a fan. But there's been an ongoing discussion as to why the Rays' attendance is low. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers and our, our hockey, uh, 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 the, the Lightning, uh, their, their uh, games are almost always sold out who both play in Tampa uh, and and don't have attendance issues. So is the low attendance for the baseball teams because they play in St. Pete and not in Tampa? Or are we just not faithful baseball followers? There's talk about moving the Rays to another, has been talk about moving the Rays to another city, but now uh, it seems that they've announced plans to build a brand new stadium in the same place as the old one. Well, large salaries and, and full stadiums don't always mean Uh, ultimate success and winning the World Series, as we very well know. But the point is, the ultimate success of the Tampa Bay Rays will depend on who responds to this invitation and shows up with their attendance and financial support. Now, this may all seem very trivial, talking about a baseball team when Israel is burning. But the same is true with the church. Our success depends on who responds to the invitation to the party and upholds the mission of the church of Jesus Christ with their, with their presence and the, with their prayers, with their financial sacrifice, their service to others. And one thing that's very important, maybe the most important thing, with their witness, their witness, I'm often asked, how do we get more people in our, in our worship services? Um, Tim Keller, pastor, author, um, who just recently, recently died, um, said this. He said the gospel, the gospel was spread in the early church by personal conversation and life examples, not through programs and not even through preachers. This parable is not about serving the poor and the marginalized. Uh, The statements just previous to this were, and there are many, many other uh, uh, commands by Jesus and calls on our lives to serve the poor and the marginalized, but this particular parable is not about that. This this particular parable emphasizes uh, emphasizes, uh, our witness, spreading the message of our faith to those who are on the outside. Jesus said in the very next, in the very next verses, whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my, my disciples. And just earlier, Jesus said, The harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So we hear this parable this morning as a prophetic word of Jesus to his church, a church that has a tendency to become to become, become the establishment, just like the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious establishment Jesus originally spoke this parable to, who were comfortable, who were comfortable in a false confident, uh, in a false confidence 
of their own salvation. Almighty and gracious God, we give thanks for the parables of Jesus. But help us, help us make these stories our stories. I give thanks for these who are faithful to, uh, who are here and joining us online and in our Port Tampa campus, who are faithful to the cause of Christ, who are faithful to our worship services, who are faithful in their sacrificial giving uh, to uphold our ministries and missions so that we can make a kingdom-like difference in the world, a kingdom-shaped difference in the world. But help each one of us, O oh God, by and through your Holy Spirit, to be a witness, uh, to not be ashamed of our faith, not that we have to be obnoxious about it, but not be ashamed of our faith and share our witness and share our story and share our faith to those who do not know you but desperately need you. We ask these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.